from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to the Lessing J. Rosenwald Room in the Rare Book and Special Collections Division of the Library of Congress. Um, uh, thank you for coming to this month's Thursday afternoon lecture. My name is Michael North, and I'm head of the Rare Book Reading Room, which is right across the hall. Uh, today, I am pleased to introduce Elise Friedland, who is Associate Professor of Classics and Art History in the Department of Classical and Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at the George Washington University here in Washington, D.C. She holds a BA in Classics from Williams College and an MA and PhD in Classical Art and Archaeology from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Professor Friedland specializes in Roman marble sculpture that was imported and displayed in the ancient Near East. And she has published two co-edited volumes on the topic, The Sculptural Environment of the Roman Near East Reflections on Culture, Ideology, and Power in 2008, and the Oxford Handbook of Roman Sculpture in 2015 by Oxford University Press, as well as a monograph, The Roman Marble Sculptures from the Sanctuary of Pan at Caesarea Philippi Panias in Israel in 2012. Her current research, which investigates American adoptions and adaptations of classical motifs, grows out of a course she developed for George Washington University entitled Greece and Rome in Washington, D.C., Classical Influences on Our Founding Fathers. In the fall of 2017, uh, Professor Friedland was granted a U.S. Capitol Historical Society Fellowship to study Constantino Brumidi's Pompeian-style 19th century frescoes, um, 19th century fresco cycle in the Senate Appropriations Committee room S-127 in the Senate wing of the U.S. Capitol building. Please welcome her. Thank you so much, Michael, and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm delighted to be here, um, and Michael did a pretty good job of giving you some background. Um, but I just needed to go through some thank yous before we get started. So um, a lot of people have been very wonderful and gracious and supportive. And first I have to thank um, the team from the office of the curator of the Capitol. So we have the curator of the Capitol here, Michelle Cohen, and some assistant curators of the Capitol, Jen Blancato and Vicky Volano. Um, and I also wanna thank the former curator of the Capitol, Barbara Wolanin. Um, as Michael said, I had a U.S. Capital Historical Society Fellowship, and I'd also like to thank William D. Giacomantonio for that and all his support, um, and also a colleague at George Mason University, um, Carol Matouche. Uh, my own institution also supplied some funding for this, so got to give GW a little shout out. Um, but also, there was an entire team from the Library of Congress who has been incredible in helping me on my magical adventure that I've been on since last August. Um, so starting with Michael North here, who um, retrieved these giant books from Fort Meade on my behalf. Um, and then um, Stephanie Stillo and Jeff Flannery, uh, Barbara Natanson in prints and photographs, Cheryl Fox, your, the archivist here, um, Michelle Crowell, who um, you'll see helped me with um, uh, Meg's journal, um, John Cole, the historian, and Jan McKelvey. So um, it's I've been a fabulous experience uh, conducting research here, but it's taken quite a lineup of, of specialists and experts to support me, and I'm I'm incredibly thankful to everyone. Um, as Michael said, I don't usually deal with books, rare books, because we don't have any more of those from when I work and where I usually live. I usually live in the Roman world um, because I'm a Roman sculpture specialist. And, and in particular, I work in the ancient Near East, in Israel and Jordan. Um, so, you, so you can just see what I'm doing there. So your question is probably, what are you doing talking about 19th century painting and 19th century publications? 
Well, I, as Michael pointed out, when I moved to GW exactly 10 years ago, I developed a course called Greece and Rome in Washington, D.C., Classical Influences on Our Founding Fathers. And as part of that class, I called up the curator of the Capitol and asked if she would give my class a tour, and that was Barbara Wolanin. And she took us all around the Capitol and showed us architecture, but she also showed us some painting. Um, this famous uh, uh, fresco on the underside of the rotunda by Constantino Brumidi, right? The apotheosis of George Washington. And then she took us into um, another, she took us into the Senate corridors and this room, S-127. And we were in there for about 10 minutes. And when we came out, I said to her, whoa, <coughs> there's a lot going on in that room. And she said, yes, and no one has ever studied it before completely. Would you like to do that? And I thought to myself, dude, that is after Constantine. My world ends in 324 AD. I am not responsible for anything after Constantine. And besides that painting, I do sculpture. So in my head, I had this little dialogue. And I said, oh, that's an interesting thought. And then I moved on. Three years later, I'm teaching the class again. I try to email Barbara to get a tour. No response. I call the office. Vicky answers and says, oh, I'm sure the new curator of the Capitol would like to give you a tour. And so then I met Michelle, and she took our class in there for 45 minutes. And while she was talking to my students about Bramidi, I finally got a look at that room, S-127. It was meant to, uh, originally made for the Naval Affairs Committee, and today is the Senate Appropriations Committee meeting room. And um, we had this fabulous exchange about some things I was seeing in the room. And she said, you know, I really think you should work on this room. She had no idea what Barbara had said. And so then I thought, OK, that's two curators of the Capitol in the space of three years. Somebody is trying to tell me something. And the rest is history, right? So here is the room that we are talking about. Um, this is S-127. Today it is the Senate Appropriations Committee meeting room. Um, but originally, as I said, it was made to house the Naval <laughs> Affairs Committee, right? And it did that um, from about 1860 until 1897. Then it housed a variety of different committees until it became the Senate Appropriations Committee meeting room in 1912. Um, this room is pretty important in terms of its decoration because it is the first full-scale commission done by Constantino Brumidi, right, the guy who was famous for the apotheosis right here. Um, it, this is actually his first full-scale commission. Um, and it is pretty different than many of his other painted rooms in the Senate wing. Why? Because if you look at it, for example, in comparison to the Senate reception room, it is much more coherent, um, this Naval Affairs Committee meeting room, is much more coherent in terms of its style. So this tends to mix a variety of different styles. Um, and it's also much more coherent in terms of its narrative program, what is the story it's trying to tell through um, the paintings. So um, this is a pretty important first thing by Brumidi in the Capitol to study. And in fact, um, I want to give you a little bit of background about um, our artist Brumidi. He um, was actually Italian. Right, so he um, was born in Rome and he went to a very famous art academy there, um, the Accademia di San Luca. Um, and unfortunately, he got caught up in the Italian Revolution and um, sort of became a political refugee, such that in 1852, he came to the United States. And he was here because he had commissions in churches in New York. Um, he also painted in Philadelphia, Baltimore, Havana, and even Mexico City. And at one point, he was on his way, at one point in 1854, I think, he was on his way back from Mexico City to New York, his sort of home base, when he met Montgomery Meigs, who had been hired as the engineer of the Capitol to complete the construction, and he believed decoration, of the Capitol building. Um, and so Megs, it was perfect timing because Megs was looking for someone who could decorate the interior of the Capitol building um, with elaborate Roman style frescoes. And he was having a dreadful time finding any American painter who was able to fit that bill. 
and along came Constantino Brumidi. Um, so he, Megs hired Brumidi to do a little test panel um, on the House side. Um, the, apparently the senators were very favorable about it. Megs liked it, and the rest is history. He hired Constantino Brumidi, who is today um, sometimes known as the Michelangelo of the Capitol or the artist of the Capitol. Now, what I wanted to do is give you a quick orientation to the room because then I want to get to, well, why are you here in the Library of Congress? Like, what has this got to do? Why shouldn't we be in the Capitol building right now? Um, so let me just sort of give you a quick visual tour of the room, um, and then I will explain what we're doing here. Um, so this is the room from another angle, and you, you can see that the decorative program, the fresco cycle, involves sort of four main areas. It involves um, the walls, right? So there are nine of these sort of solid background panels with floating maidens in them. And then it involves these lunettes. I'm gonna actually just go like this. So there are nine of these kinds of panels and then the lunettes over them that today have architectural scenes in them. They were originally meant to have famous naval battles from American history in them. Um, there are two bays in the room. Actually, I'm going to back up just so you can see that. Can you see that there's one bay here and there would have been another <coughs> bay here? And on these bays, there are sort of four um, areas that have niches in them, and each niche is filled with its own marine deity, right? Because you're in the Naval Affairs Committee meeting room. So, you know, you can see there's Neptune, and um, we have Amphitrite, and we have Aeolus, oh, and so there's one who's the goddess America. Um, so she's a little aberration. But anyway, um, and each uh, deity is in a niche and then flanked by two attendants, right? And then finally, there are these bands. There are three bands, one here, there's one in the center of the room, and there's one on the other side of the room. So that is Brumidi's decorative scheme for this room. Now, it was known to the former curator of the Capitol. I mean, this room obviously looks very Roman in style, right? Um, but in fact, the former curator of the Capitol had identified one part of this room that seemed to be a dead ringer for was definitely based on an actual painting from Pompeii. And so you can see that right here. I'm just going to test this, but I know that, right, no, no photons. Okay, here we go. Um, so the pointer doesn't work on this. You need a reflective surface. Um, anyway, so this is a floating maiden right here. And if we look, she is actually based on this fresco, this Roman wall painting um, that is from the house of the ship at Pompeii. Okay, and her question was, the reason she had approached me was, she wanted to know, were there other matches in the room, or did Brumidi sort of start with this and kind of make the rest of the room up, right? So that was the big question, and that's sort of why um, Barbara Wallanen and Michelle Cohen hired me to study this room, right? And I began in August of 2017, and um, I, I um, I kind of was getting panicked by early October because I wasn't finding any other matches. And I started getting really nervous that a bunch of people were going to be very disappointed in me. And then I realized, let's think about this. Naval Affairs Committee meeting room. This is from the House of the Ship. I wonder if Rumi had some publication of the House of the Ship and took a bunch of other figures from that and altered them, right? but then I couldn't find a publication of the house of the ship. But I did find this drawing, which is in volume one, right over there. <laughs> okay, and it turns out that this is the only complete drawing of the entire wall in which our floating Nenad figures, okay? It is very common to see just this floating mean ad reproduced in several publications from the early 19th century uh, of, of wall paintings from Pompeii. But this is the only complete drawing of the entire wall, which was the south wall of a dining room in this house of the ship, the Casa di Naviglio. And it turns out that this drawing is from a, a very uh, important publication by Wilhelm Zahn 
uh, the most beautiful ornaments and um, the most uh, fancy wall paintings from Pompeii, Herculaneum, and Stadia. Okay? And as I was looking at this drawing and saying, yes, there's our Minad, I started realizing, <coughs> hold on, I recognize other things, like these columns. Right? So, oops, sorry, there's our floating Minad, right? You can see. But I also recognize these columns. And then I realized that it turns out that Constantino Brumidi based his entire design of the room on this one drawing. So you can see that he not only adopts flanking, floating uh, minads, he turns them into maidens, but he's got the flanking columns, and the central narrative scene got turned into a doorway, right? So less work for him creating complex figural scenes. Not that he couldn't take that on, he was fabulous, right? And in fact, this um, scheme, the design scheme for the walls goes even further because you can see that the, the wall in the Pompeian dining room had this vegetal border. Well, we have that here, a version by Brunetti. Um, it was originally topped by some fantastic creatures. They got turned into swans. Um, and it has some vegetal motifs in the lower corners, and those got turned into cornucopia by Brunetti. So he really did look very carefully at this and um, match what he was doing um, one to one. So the question for me was then, OK, I began to read about this book by Wilhelm Zahn. And I realized that this was a big, large, fancy, expensive book. It is not something that a political refugee is going to be carrying from Italy across the ocean with him. So I thought, how did he have access for this? And what is this book? The other thing that struck me was that, you know, I teach a course on Pompeii, and I do a little part of that on the history of Pompeii and the transmission of Pompeian art, um, you know, the dissemination of the images and things. And I thought, why have I never heard of Wilhelm Zahn? I mean, I know William Gell, I know Francois Maswa, I know all these characters. I'll introduce you to them in a little bit. I've never heard of Wilhelm Zahn. And I started asking some of my colleagues, oh, uh, Wilhelm Zahn. And they'd say, yeah, I've never really heard of him. And I thought, well, that's weird, because Brumidi's heard of him. Where, and where's this book? Because I also had spoken with somebody um, that I got connected to through the US Capitol Historical Society, um, who is a painter who does um, historical paintings of DC. And I said, so could he, could Brumidi have done this from his head? And he said, absolutely not. He would have needed a model to design something that complex. Absolutely not. So I decided to start looking around, where could I find this book? And I thought, did the Library of Congress own this book? And that's why we're here today. <laughs> um, because I landed up getting in touch with Michael Lawrence. And I said, look in your catalog. It says you have these books. Could I see them? And he heroically got them from Fort Meade, where they've been in storage for goodness knows how long. And um, behold, I was able to find tons more matches. So these columns here that Brumidi painted in the room, um, you can see that this lower part comes directly from this drawing by Zahn, right, on plate 16. And we're going to watch because another part he also takes from the same plate. Okay. So not only does he base architectural features, there he also has an individual drawing of just his favorite floating minad. And there are other floating figures that match as well. So she was a, um, a victory goddess carrying a trophy. So you just you know, lose the wings and change the trophy into a tenant. And you've got to put clothes on all these people. <laughs> still today in the Naples Archaeological Museum. And you can check this out. I mean, even down to his tongue sticking out, right? Brumidi has, has based this on this drawing. Right, Brumidi, we can't guarantee he would know this, but we can see that he was looking at Wilhelm Zahn. And just another attendant planking Neptune. 
you can see here, okay, so it was a Europa and the bull, but he changed the bull into a hippocamp, and then the horse turned his head away because there was no sort of romantic myth behind it. <laughs> uh, so, but you can see, right, you believe me that Brumidi was actually using Wilhelm Zahn's drawings, right? Okay, so how did, how did Brumidi get, get a hold of this book? And, and, and the real question is, um, could these books be the exact copies that Zahn was using? And he had the commission for this room in 1856, and he completed it in 1858. So the hunt was on. Here I am when I first met Michael and the books by Wilhelm Zahn, right? And I wanted to try to figure out um, whether or not Brumidi could have used these. And this is one of the funniest stories of this whole mystery. I, I mean, I'm an archaeologist and an art historian, and I've worked in museums. You know, I've been a visiting assistant curator here and blah, blah, blah. So I turned to Michael when I got hold of these books finally, and I said, could I see your file on these books? And he looked at me and he said, file on the books? And I said, well, yeah, where have these things been? Like, I don't know, where'd you get them? When'd you get them? Who's used them? And he said, we don't keep files like that. And I thought, what do you mean? Because in a museum, every object that walks in the building and belongs to your collection has a file and you know where it's been every second of every day, basically. And he said, we have a lot of books like this. <laughs> so I was like, right, okay, I'm gonna have to reconstruct the provenience of this <laughs> book. So um, there were several things that were helpful. Michael and I began sleuthing together, right? Um, it turns out that there is a blind stamp in the front, on the frontispiece of both of these books. And um, that blind stamp is actually tied to the first international copyright law. This is all very exciting. Um, and because you can see it says, um, Fairchild Poem, 13th May, 1846. So in 1846, on the 13th of May, there was a convention established between um, Prussia and Britain um, and that uh, had to do with the export of books and paying taxes. And so it, if a book was meant to be exported to Britain, it had to have this kind of stamp on it. Um, and so... Uh, we know, therefore, that the book, which incidentally was printed in Berlin by a very famous publisher, Georg Reimer, um, and the volume one was printed in 1829, um, volume two that you see there, 1841 to 44, volume three we don't have because it's after Brumidi and he didn't use it, but that was 1852 to 1859. So, um, we know that this thing, volume one at least, was printed in 1829, and that it had to have left uh, Germany, uh, to use a large uh, historically not so accurate term, um, after September 1st, when this went into effect of 1846. Okay, that's good, right? Um, so we, we, we kind of have an idea of when the book left. We know that it must have gone to Britain, otherwise it wouldn't have had that stamp in it. Um, but Michael said, yeah, not to worry. There are tons of booksellers, right, selling to America and Britain, so that's cool. That could have taken that path. There's also this stamp, um, this book stamp of the Library of Congress, and it turns out that this was a common stamp used in the mid-19th century. Um, and um, actually, the archivist, Cheryl, um, told me one of the dead readers here is that this is listed as Library of Congress City of Washington, as opposed to Washington, D.C., that the name tends to change after the Civil War. Okay, so that was good, but here's the dead ringer. Um, then I began searching through published catalogs of the Library of Congress to try to determine if I could see when we acquired this book, right? And that also required Michael's help because although the Hathi Trust has a lot of the catalogs, the published catalogs of the Library of Congress online, they didn't have anything between 1830 and like 1850 something. And so 18, after my time, like 1859 or something, and I was like, oh, I have this gap, Michael, do you have your catalog from 18, you know? And so I looked through all the catalogs and behold, we can see that in 1849, here's the first record of the Library of Congress's ownership of Zahn's publication. And we have volumes one and two here. 
there. Uh, note that they're classified under gardening, painting, et cetera, according to Jefferson's category of imagination after Bacon. I thought that was very funny, gardening, painting, et cetera. But there they are. So we know that they made their way here by 1849. And that's in plenty of time for our hero to consult them in 1854, or, so that, or 56. So that's exciting. So that's good. So I think I can make a pretty sound argument that um, he could have used these exact volumes. But then I decided to try going a step further. So it turns out that Montgomery Maggs, who was kind of Brumidi's patron, if you will, kept a journal, fortunately. I mean, and he wrote down every matter of detail. It was unbelievable. Well, it's only unbelievable if you read it in the transcribed version. Because it turns out that the guy wrote in this thing called Pittman shorthand. Has oh anyone gosh. ever tried to read Pittman shorthand? <laughs> so, okay. Uh, my daughter's taking Arabic, and you saw that some of my research is in Jordan. It's like scarier than Arabic. Here, look. <laughs> <laughs> Even more impenetrable to me than Arabic. So I uh, went over to Madison, and I met with Jeff Flannery, and he got the journal out for me, and we tried to look at it because, see, what happened was in 2000, for the anniversary of the Capitol building, they hired this incredible person who could still read Pittman shorthand to transcribe the diaries of Montgomery Meigs, especially the ones that had to do with the Capitol building, right? So I had this searchable PDF, and I could see that on, in, in English, you know, in <laughs> um, that I could see that on June 22nd, 1858, when my room is completed, when he's all done with the room, Megs is in there admiring the room, and he says, the Pompeii rooms are better than the examples for Pompeii in the book of blank, and the other styles are as well represented as in any of the plays given in any of these books. Well, what happened was our transcriber was going along doing his thing transcribing, but he doesn't know names like Mazwa, Gel, Zahn, Nicolini, Ternite. He doesn't know those names. So he came across a word that was a proper name that he didn't know, and he left it blank. And there are blanks like this throughout the transcription. You can understand, right? Um, it's hard to keep up with Montgomery Max. So, so Jeff and I thought, well, maybe we could look at the diary and we could figure this out. And then we looked at the diary and we were like, yeah, you pretty much need to read Pittman shorthand to figure that out. So then I met Michelle Crowell and she um, said, well, I have um, um, an elderly woman who used to do some things for us who lives in Quincy, Massachusetts. Here's her email address. So I emailed her and she was amazing. She emailed me back. Um, I sent her uh, color printouts of these images with stickies everywhere. And I could tell that this, because it's the last sentence of the June 22nd journal entry, and this is the last sentence, because there's an X here that means the end of the sentence, and here's 23rd for the start of the next journal entry, right? So I could see there's the previous end of the previous sentence. So I knew it was this sentence, and I could kind of see that some of the words where he repeated Pompeian or Pompeian, so I was able to narrow it down, and she read it for me, and she said, hey, guess what? There's your word, and it says, it's a phonetic shorthand, so it says Zom. Uh, um. So in case you were doubting my art historical <laughs> sleuthing and all the other work that everyone else at the Library of Congress had been doing to help me, Montgomery Max went and confirmed it for us. You <laughs> should have just read the journal. <laughs> well, in any event, so that pretty much tells us that these volumes, you know, then there is the slight question, did they make it through the fire in 1851? But I've sort of left that alone. I <laughs> chose not to go down that rabbit hole. This is filled with rabbit holes. Um, so anyway, I would, I, I don't know, I believe that I can make a fairly strong argument for the fact that, that our hero was, and, and Meg's his patron were looking at these exact volumes. So um, then my question was, well, how did we know to buy those things in 1849? Because I don't know about them, and I'm a scholar of you know, Roman art, 
and I teach a course on Pompeii, and I've never heard of this dude. So how do they know to buy these volumes by Wilhelm Zahn, right? And so what I thought I should do is put this in a little bit of the context of the history of excavations of Pompeii. So here's um, a, a map of Pompeii, and I don't know if you can sort of read this from where you're sitting, but it has the dates of all of the excavations of the city. And you can see that we are sort of, if we're, um, so the house of the ship is discovered in 1826. Um, and that's this blue part, right? And Brunini is alive and sort of learning to be an artist during the largest excavation campaign to date, which occurred between 1815 and 1860. Right, I mean, Pompeii gets discovered in 1748. Initially, they thought it was actually another little town, Stabii. Um, so it took them a while to figure out where they were. And these first excavations, um, which you can see here, it's a light gray, but it doesn't show up very well on the screen, um, were in this theater area and the triangular forum and a little piece up here. But then there was a second wave of excavations um, uh, in 1806 to 1815, it's the so-called um, French decade. Um, but then the Bourbon Restoration from 1815 to 1860 is when there's really the largest scale excavations that have ever been conducted at the site. And this is the, the lifetime of, of Brumidi, right? And the other thing that's important for you to know, and oh, just here's a little marker to show you where the house of the ship is located. Right, um, so it was excavated in, in three different years and our room with its wall painting is found in 1826. Um, so this means that this is also the era of huge publication of the site of, of Pompeii. And this is the time when all sorts of, um, you know, artists and architects and elite were going to the Bay of Naples area and looking at the discoveries that were being made before their very eyes at Pompeii, right? So this is the, you know, still the era of the Grand Tour. I don't know if you've heard of the Grand Tour. Um, and so here are some, op some uh, examples of the kinds of publications that were beginning to appear. Right, um, and it's just three of the most important and well-known publications. So you, from the night, from the first half of the 19th century. So you have William Gell, who writes something called Pompeiana, and it's published between 1817 and 1832. French, Francois Maslow, Hernandez Pompeii, from 1824 to 1838, and then the famous Nicolini brothers. Uh, Fausto and Felice Nicolini in 1854. And what I wanted you to see was that um, these volumes are very similar to one another because while they do have some um, plates in them and some drawings and some of them are these uh, very alluring reconstructions that get populated by ancients, you know? So you can, they sort of reconstruct the houses that have been excavated and they install Romans in them, you know, swishing around the atrium or whatever. <laughs> Most of what's in these volumes is that. <laughs> Narrative discussion of what they are discovering. Very helpful, extremely important. But as I began to download 19th century publications from the University of Heidelberg and the Getty Research Institute, thank God for digitization of these things, and then I was looking at these, I thought, Zahn doesn't look like these guys. He's different, right? And in fact, Zahn is different in a lot of ways. And so here's just the frontispiece um, from volume one that you can see on the screen and we could look at later if you wanted. So how is Zahn different? First of all, um, Zahn is bilingual, right? So those others that I had shown you, you know, one was by a British guy, one was by a French guy, the Nicolini brothers are Italian and they're in their respective languages, right? We are bilingual, we're in German and in French and the real difference is these are really virtually all images. He, he um, has one page of, quote, text that are mini catalog entries. So you have some minimal information about the background for each image. That appears at the front. 
and then there are a bunch of plates in between, and then there's another set of 10 and a bunch of plates in between. So there's only one page of text per folio. It is not at all narrative in any way, shape, or form. And the other thing that's radically different about these is the color. Okay. And you can see that as you look at the table, and you can see that here. Um, and it really makes Zahn, oops, where's my color? There you go. It really makes Zahn stand out, right? So who was this guy? And you know, I figured I'm going to have to put this guy on the map a little bit um, for the general discussion. Certainly specialists who um, work with um, this era know about him, but you know, People who are just general Roman art historians seem to not have heard of him. So he was a German decorative painter. He was born in 1800, and he trained at the Cassell Academy of Fine Arts, after which he went to Paris for about a year and hung out with Antoine Jean Gros, very famous uh, neoclassical painter. And then Wilhelm Zahn lived in Pompeii from 1824 or 25 to 1829, and again from 1830 to 1840. And he was just hanging around while things were being discovered and drawing them, okay? And he says in his introduction that his goal at Pompeii was, quote, to copy as faithfully as possible ancient paintings and to reproduce the original with the accuracy that science demands. So he's responsible not only for this, um, these, this set of, well, you have two volumes here, but there is a third one, but he also published many other things, sev several other um, volumes. And he is an extraordinary character uh, in many ways. He was befriended by Goethe in 1829, and in fact, when Zahn returns um, to Berlin uh, for this break in between. He uh, goes to Goethe and Goethe immediately befriends him and he spends weeks at a time with Goethe and gets introduced to all kinds of important people like, you know, the future king of Prussia. <laughs> um, and um, he is also extremely important because um, he's a major figure in the development of color lithography, which I had no idea until recently. I mean, this is all a whole new world to me. I moved to the 19th century. Little did I know how big that move was going to be, right? And so um, he really used the publication of these volumes to push forward the technology of lithography and chromolithography. Um, and apparently you can, now I'm not trained to see this, so I. I can't point this out, and I'm sorry for that, but apparently you can see him develop the technology from volume to volume to volume, which is fascinating. Um, this was also a massive effort and expense. Um, I read that it turns out that Georg Reimer, who is a pretty well-known large publisher in Berlin, um, when he agreed to publish volume one, this wasn't originally conceived as a three volume set, it was just gonna be one volume. When he originally agreed to publish volume one, he withheld the payment from Zahn until he could see that it was a financially successful endeavor. And so once that he saw that people were buying these, he paid Zahn and eventually Zahn came back um, and did volume two and then volume three. But um, we have some descriptions by Zahn himself, which we know about because Goethe includes them in a review he does of, vo of Zahn's volume one, in which, Von in which Zahn talks about setting up the lithography workshop, because this didn't exist, and talking about 20 printers and four to five artists, and it was, it was incredible. Um, now, there are some other um, interesting uh, things that I just want to point out, but I am going to wrap it up so I don't keep people too long and I can try to answer questions. Um, and that is, this is only a connection I made just recently. So Zahn talks about being most proud of some specific plates in each of the volumes that he's done in terms of the challenge that it was to produce them and get the color and just right and things, and this is one of them. This is plate 99 from volume one. And um, 
it turns out that that's blue, right? Because we have blue in our room. And everybody's always saying, oh, it's American blue, you know, Bermudi just Americanized the background. He took the black, right? He took away the black Pompeian background and he made it blue. And we actually have a watercolor study in which he also tried out a red background. But I, I never, I mean, I was always thinking it's just Ameri a sort of American blue background, right? Well, now I'm pretty convinced that he picked this blue up from actual Pompeian wall paintings that he had seen. And there's a whole debate, actually, about this plate um, that I'm currently reading about, because we not only have Zahn's depiction of it, but we have a 19th century um, gouache of it. And the blues are slightly different, and the, the, the painted one is much closer to our blue in the room. So it's just fascinating to look at that. But anyway, um, so, that's, so that's one thing. Um, another thing that I'm looking into is, I wonder if Bermudi actually knew Wilhelm Zahn. If you look at, at their lives, okay, so first of all, they're both artists, right? Um, and there are areas that are listed in red where they overlap, right? And so Zahn is known to have stopped in Rome for a bit before he went down to Pompeii. He came from Paris, stopped in Rome, and went to Pompeii. And so I'm in touch with um, a former US Capital Historical Society fellow who um, has worked before in the archives of the Academia di San Luca, the famous art school where Brumidi was trained, and would know this, you know, is this something that would, might be recorded? My question is, if you were an artist and you hit Rome, would you stop by this famous art school? I mean, I think you would, right? And so they could have met maybe there. Certainly, Gumidi would have gone down to the Bay of Naples. Zahn was hanging out there with, you know, admittedly other artists. But still, I, I, I want to see if that's a rabbit hole I would like to go down to see if I can find some way that they are connected, if they are connected or knew one another or met one another. Um, so. Um, that's, that's one idea. The other thing that um, I need to do some more work on is I would like to see um, if I can understand the circumstances under which the Library of Congress acquired those volumes. So it turns out, right, that there are notes from the committee of the library or the committee for the library that are in the National Archives. Oh boy, anybody got any leads over there? Um, but you can, you can read the discussions about acquisitions and what to spend your money on. And so that I also want to follow up on because I'm fascinated by um, how they thought to acquire these volumes. And I've been looking at the catalogs and I'm still doing this to see. So in 1849, we did own Gell, the British guy. We owned Bonucci, a different Italian guy, and we owned the sort of catalog of the Bourbon Museum. But we did not own the French volume by Francois Mazois. We did not own another German volume of, of Pompeian wall paintings by this guy named Ternite. Um, and the Nicolini brothers hadn't published their thing yet in 1849. But I might look to see if we purchased that in 1854, shortly thereafter when it came out, whether you know they. But the question is, why did they pick these volumes? as opposed to Francois Mazois, as opposed to somebody else. It's interesting. Um, so that's another thing that I want to look into. And the last thing, of course, is I have a lot to learn about color lithography, which is very complicated. Um, and, and it will be interesting to see what we can then um, learn from these samples that we have here, these copies that we have here. I have done a little bit of sleuthing using OCLC. And I can see 26 entries, 26 other volumes around the world. So the other interesting thing would be to know more about how many of these were printed, how rare is this, things like that. Um, so anyway, I, I thank you all for listening. And I have really enjoyed figuring out how we went from sort of you know, discovering Pompeii in 1826 to publishing it in 1829 in Germany, in Berlin, to painting it in adapted form on the walls of the US Capitol Building. Thank you. <laughs>
I have my backup right here. <laughs> no, no, they're not true fresco. Not the, not the wall paintings, not the main ads. And the ceiling is a tempera. It's not, not, nothing actually in that room is true fresco. Actually, well, no, that's not true. The, it's not, they've been scratched out, but the navel scenes would have been true fresco. That's a whole sort of drama on the side that didn't really relate, so I just left it. There was an artist who got asked to com commission to paint these, and they, they weren't happy with them, and he was disgruntled because he wasn't getting paid enough, and he scratched out his paintings in those architecture. But we have his name uh, scratched <laughs> in. He was angry, so his name is scratched in deeply into the plaster. But those panels were actually painted in one fresco, whereas the rest of the room was painted on dry walls. Mm -hmm. And with different kinds of, yes, with different kinds of paint. Isn't there some Well, there were oil? different artists that worked with Rumidi. Rumidi. Right, I mean, he had a, ca a cast of, of people working with him. Because he covered an incredible amount of territory in the Capitol building. Um, I see a question back there, and then I'm going to come back to you. You might have said this. I mean, Megs clearly did point for me to a lot of sources. So, I mean, I, I think they had a mutual admiration society going there. And I think they really, um, you know, Megs really was a conduit for helping Gumidi um, gather this information and access it. But it's hard to know the concept if it really came from, I don't know. I mean, I, I, th I, I sort of like your theory of perhaps they did know each other yeah. in Rome. And I mean, every artist is looking for images. That's what you know artists do today, <laughs> but they go online <laughs> instead of you know, looking for a folio print. So I, I think um, that it's, it is hard to know. It may be that Rumidi had this idea and the Megs just encouraged him. I don't know <coughs> the origin of I don't believe that Megs originated the idea for this Pompeian style, but. It's a good it, question. Well, here's something that I did, and I didn't think to put a, an image of this in here. Here's something that I did also do in the Library of Congress. There was another proposal drawn up for this room by another artist named James Leslie. And, and we have that in the Prints and Photographs Division in the Madison Building. And they, they found them, and they uncovered them for me. And it was this, I made a scene because they uncovered these and I was like, oh, those are horrible. They are not Pompeian at all. It's like a Rococo artist trying to do Pompeii. It, it was not at all right, okay? And um, it's clear to me that Megs, who had the choice of Rumidi's proposed thing, the drawing, and James Leslie, was discerning enough to know this is Pompeian style. That is a Rococo artist trying to look like. I mean, so he had the proper divisions of the walls, and but then he had these kinds of hokey subjects in there. I mean, like little coral things of coral, something that we, we don't have that in the ancient world. It just was all wrong, and and so in that degree, I know. That, that, he, that Megs was clearly discerning. And we know a lot about Megs as a patron and the fact that Megs you know, used the library in New York extensively and clearly was using the Library of Congress extensively and was very learned. And that's another path. I have a lot of other rabbit holes. But I really want to look at um, the curriculum of West Point when Megs went to school there because I want to see where he got this um, direct link to the ancient world, where he got that knowledge. And we also have another quote from him. I, I, I sort of put some extra um, slides in here. Hang on one second. That's it. Um, you know, there was a, um, this was, to decorate a, a room in the Pompeian style was all the rage in this period. And particularly in palaces. <coughs> 
um, as far north as Oslo. So this wasn't just in you know, France and Italy and Spain, but I can show you in Oslo, and I've also been reading an article recently by uh, a scholar, um, a, a colleague of mine who does um, usually Roman wall painting, but um, Ludwig of Bavaria, who actually um, had the interior decoration of this palace he built modeled directly from Wilhelm Zahn, built the first reconstruction of a Pompeian house you know, outside of Italy. So one of his castles is the Pompeianum um, in the southern area of Bavaria, and he, he, he was basing it directly on images from here. So Meg says in one of his diaries that I want to build a palace for the people. So his goal was to decorate the US Capitol building the way you know, uh, royalty were decorating their palaces throughout Europe. So my question is, how does he know that? How does he know that? Because at this point in his life, he had not been to Europe yet. Yes, ma'am. I think that's essentially, I was trying to figure out how did Romini know about these books, and that's essentially what you just struggled to answer. Yeah, and I just hope that this colleague, Kit Tiziano, I, I did hear from him, but it was a, I'm opening a big exhibition, I'll get back to you. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, I really hope that he can help me, because <coughs> I just, I just don't know enough about the culture and how things worked in the mid or you know early 19th century in Rome or in Europe. But it seems to me that if you're coming from the Cassell Academy and you're going to to up, you know Paris to study with this neoclassical painter and school, that when you go to Rome, you're going to know where the academy is, where Canova is the teacher, and things like that. So it seems to me that he would have had to have had a connection some, I mean, he would have known this academy and stopped there, but I don't know, I'm gonna ask Tiziano who wrote a giant dissertation on the Italian Revolution and its impact on the artistic community of Rome. So he's gonna have a handle on this for me. You know, this other question though about the Megs and the Pompeii connection, thinking back that there was this competition, if both artists were informed or trying to approximate a Pompeian style, then that really would mean that Megs was driving that because he would have created the parameters and this was naval affairs. Right. So Brumidi, knowing the source, really I think sort of had the ace in the hole because he was going back to these, you know, think about this, this you know, house of the, what did the ship? The, had the house of the ship, the Casa del Navio. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that was a perfect source Isn't for naval affairs. Isn't that cute? Yes. Yeah. Now, mind you, the all, he didn't, that was the only thing from the house of the ship that he took that floating maiden and the and the columns and the sort of design yeah, of the room that's the key right decoration. but the other but the other figures that i showed you come from all over and some we don't even have their um, original context anymore they just got cut out of their walls and he saw them in the he says if zahn says Na Ar archaeological museum in naples you know sorry because the competition sketches are just for those walls right <laughs> right that's a good point <laughs> there's a well we had to just pdf it i just got to search the pdf it's 54 it's 54 it took that many years i'm trying no not i'm 55. not I, i'm not sure actually i don't i'd have to check i think it's 54 55 but it's in his diary because so i this is just full disclosure the um the yucky thing that i saw it's not yucky but you know the thing that's not right that i saw by james leslie um <laughs> is um it, it was purchased by the Library of Congress. And I was like, how did you know to purchase that? And how did you know that this was a drawing submitted for this contest, if you will, or this competition? Co competition. And it seems that uh, we, I've had a hard time getting anybody to reconstruct that. But what I do know is I've talked with Barbara Wallam, the former curator of the Capitol, and she is the one who said, look, this says James Leslie. We have James Leslie, and we have this, this entry in Meg's diary in which he describes, I looked at this, and it's, he's, not, he's not appropriate for the room. He's more of a decorative painter. This is what Meg says. He's more of a decorative painter, and I'll hire him to do other things, and he does do other things in the Capitol building very well, but he says he's not for the design of this whole room. So I, I, I can get you that. I just have to search my PDF of the transcribed Meg's diary. I think it was 54 or 55. I really do. Not long. Not long. 
Yes. Quick question about uh, Brumidi's painting oil. See that? He's blue, no. Well, well, he's painting a lot of different media. In this room, it is oil on plaster. Okay, fine. And, uh, so oil and casing, I think. It's a mixture. Okay, thank you. And um, one of the questions about books in the Library of Congress is, oh, did he have borrowing privileges? No. <laughs> in real world? No. Oh, no, no, that would have been, well, well, that, that, well, that been Megs. I mean, yes. Megs would have. Well, and I also started this, right, um, because Cheryl gave me the, the log, the checkout registry. Um, and that was interesting, too, because I said to the guys as they handed me this, can I look at this? Is this legal? Right, because I can't go into the library today and say, what is this student of mine? You know, what does Bushy have checked out from Gelman, right? But they said, hmm, that's a good question. Yeah. But you know, these are from 1855, so you're <laughs> <laughs> um, And I started reading through it, but I, it's um, hard to read because it's different pen. Sure. And um, also, it was, I didn't see anything like this. And I decided that's another rabbit hole to go back to, for sure. But we do have um, some letters in the files in the Office of the Carrier of the Capitol that talk about um, certain senators um, checking out books on behalf of Brumidi. So Brumidi had a couple of senatorial friends sure. who would check things out, but Brumidi mm -hmm. himself had no borrowing privileges. <coughs> so yeah. the question behind that is would he have had Zahn next to him while he was doing his art. Well, so now we have to ask about, and that's another thing that I was talking with John Cole about, but I have to do more reading and understand, but maybe one of you guys from the LSC can answer this. I mean, what was the reading room like? And at this point, we are still in the Capitol building. Sure. Could he have taken sure. one of these volumes down the hall to his room <laughs> where he was working? Didn't he have a room in the Capitol, a studio-ish? I don't even know that Brumidi had a room <laughs> studio. I guess he had a place where he could sort of keep his stuff. It, like the sculptors had real studios. Uh -huh. But since his work was all murals, but uh, yes, I mean, he had a place where he could <laughs> Could stuff. he have taken these down? There were large there? tables kind of running in the center of the room. I think these were probably shelved, probably to answer your, help answer your question about the fire, these were probably shelved as folio and not in the regular, because architecture gets wiped out in a fire, right. but the folios don't, and it may have been saved by its size. So, but I think given the size of it, I would guess he'd be more inclined to work there, just by the nature of. Um, and can an artist bring his watercolors? Well, that's another question. If he's, um, into your library at that point? Well, <laughs> their, li their library isn't quite the same as my library. <laughs> but if you, want, if you want a contemporary answer to that, no way. But no, I, I got that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, maybe, I'm sure there must have been some kind of, of I'm not sure. I would imagine it would be, wouldn't be that difficult to make that kind of arrangement if need be. Oh. And what about late 99? Okay, so this is something, I love hanging out with Michael and these books because every time I come here, Michelle, that second one is open for you and I to look at afterwards. Um, and Michael just happened to open it there and I'm like, oh my God, there are the heads. Um, but any, there are the heads. Um, but um, we, I came in and I said, Michael, the books, I wanna see plate 99, which is way back here. But you know this blue thing that I was talking about? Um, um, because I wanted to see if I could, Zahn talks about it and being very proud of this in particular because I don't understand this well enough because I don't do color lithography because it doesn't occur in the Roman world, but um, you had to print it and then he had to fill in some colors by hand and I was interested to see, could I see that? You know, but I'm not trained enough to see that. So I said, can I see plate 99? So Michael opens it and he's like, where's plate 99? It's me. It's cut out. Well, now we know uh, exactly what he did. <laughs> it's, well, except that he equates, it's more comp, at first we were like, oh my God, Brumidi. Um, but these seem to have, again, Cheryl, these seem to have been bound in like, it's in my notes, like 1910 or something. Rebound, yeah. Re okay, so Possibly rebound. Possibly rebound, or it may have been rebound for the first time. I would check the inventory of the Capitol. Right, well, that's what I said to Michael. I said, I gotta talk to Michelle and find out what's in the archives. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, framed on some senator's office wall. Um, <laughs> with an LOC stamp. With an LOC stamp. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll get a letter from us any day now. 
<laughs> Oops, I just got myself in trouble on multiple fronts. But anyway, that was a pretty cool discovery we just made standing here. So how would he have done it? Would he have, are you suggesting he would have the book there in the room and designed it on the wall? He would have sketched it on the wall or he would have sketched it out in advance? Oh, uh, we know that he had cartoons that yeah, he cartoons. sketched out in advance. So we have this one watercolor that is in the archives at the, uh, the architect of the Capitol. Um, that was his proposal to Meg. But um, what's really lovely, and then he would make larger cartoons and transfer them to the wall and blah, 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 right? But what's really interesting about this is um, that he, in a sense, is um, mirroring what Zahn used to do. So one of the things that I've read about that's so important about Zahn's books is that Zahn was standing there in front of these walls, right? And so what he would do was put tracing paper on there and you know take down the design I'm going don't don't look you'll get dizzy um, I'm going back to my whole wall there, okay here um, and then he could transfer that to the to the stones to create these lithographs right so that was the allure of lithography right it took out an intermediary step going to a copper plate Right? That would therefore make the resulting print less direct, less of an exact copy, if you will. This is going to get really complicated because you're going to get into a whole issue of copies and copying, which is a total nightmare. I know enough about that from Roman copies of Greek originals, right? So this is going to get dicey because anytime you start, is this a copy? How accurate is on? Blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, some of these wall paintings we don't have anymore, so how do we know? Um, some of them we do. In any event, that's kind of neat because that's how Zahn was creating these and that was the lure of lithography and that's why he wanted to use this medium and he worked so hard to push the medium to create these volumes. So he's the first one to really record color. I, In that I, way, I guess he we're certainly paintings, yes. Like watercolors probably. Yes. I, I'm going to be careful. Like I'm going to come back to me and like in the, after the end of the summer once I've waded through several more German articles on this topic. And also, I don't know enough about printmaking. My last job was in a department of art and art history, and my office was across from the print studio, and I was friends with that professor, but I did not pay enough attention. <laughs> and she is now at the university, I was telling Michael, she's now at the University of Richmond. That's right there. I'm calling Miss Tanya Softich, and I'm going to say, can I come for the weekend, and can you teach me all about lithography? Because, you know, what do I know? Anyway, okay. So were Zahn's volumes in the Academy of San Luca? That's good. Uh, hopefully Tiziana will reply to my email. Yes? <laughs> mm -hmm. That's a great question. That, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Um, there is something at the National Gallery that I just realized that some sort of, some sort of study of the uh, holdings what does that mean? Does that mean art or does that mean library of the Academy de San Luca? And that's another trail that this is a lot of stuff to follow up on. Um, yeah, I don't know. Okay. Sorry, one more. Okay. So the color. Um, yes. Zahn's doing an overlay and a tracing. Mm -hmm. When does he put the color? He describes the color. So part of the catalog entries that are so cute is that he describes, he'll say, the wings were yellow and the this was red and the background was red. red. I know, I know, I know. I know it's not very exact. I know. And, and so therefore, when he recreated his work in Berlin, um, he decided what blue would be blue. Because it's a gorgeous blue, and mm -hmm. it's a unique blue. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I know. Mm -hmm. Cool. And, and um, by the way, there's all sorts of important new research that, um, and, and this is not to affect Zahn, although it's interesting they noticed this, um, they re recognize this. There's all sorts of new research about the effects of the pyroclastic flow on the colored walls in Pompeii and sure. wall painting and how um, some yellows turn red. So Pompeii and red oh. might be, ooh, you know, and it, it is interesting that um, something I was reading said that some of these artists noticed some of this, like walls were 
um, transitioning. We were transitioning, that's a good way to describe it. Like part of the wall was still yellow ochre and part of it was, you know. Anyway, so, right. It's complicated, but anyway. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.